Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our third and final session for the 26 Japan Update. My name is Amy King, and I'm a lecturer in the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre at the ANU and a fellow of the Australia Japan Research Centre. I'm really delighted to bring what is an all-star panel uh, here this afternoon to talk about Japan's national security and foreign policy and to think about Japan in the, in the wider regional context. Rather than uh, sort of a lecture-style presentation, we're going to mix things up a little bit in this final session this afternoon. I know that there are lots of questions in the audience. I've already heard from various people today. Um, so we want to make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A. Um, and what our three speakers are going to do is to offer us a few, uh, few minutes, five minutes or so of remarks uh, on various aspects of this uh, issue of national security and foreign policy. I'll then uh, throw some questions to our speakers, um, but that'll be the opportunity for you to start thinking about your questions because we're going to leave plenty of time for that. So in, all, in the order in which they are going to speak to you today, uh, let me now introduce our three speakers. First up is Professor Panendra James from the University of Adelaide, where he's professor in the Department of Asian Studies. Uh, professor Jane has uh, been president formerly of the Asian Studies Association of Australia and the Japanese Studies Association of Australia, and is an expert on Japanese politics and foreign policy, as well as wider regional uh, Asian Pacific security issues. Our second speaker from Japan is Professor Noboru Yamaguchi, who is also a retired uh, Lieutenant General not working, <laughs> uh, no worries, uh, in, from the Ground Self-Defense Forces of Japan. Professor Yamaguchi is now a, president, a vice president of the International University of Japan and dean of the Graduate School of International Studies, and he's previously served as a Japanese defense attache uh, in the United States. And finally, uh, Professor Jerry Curtis, who was with us, of course, this morning for a terrific keynote lecture. Uh, professor Curtis is the uh, emeritus, sorry, uh, Professor uh, of Political Science from Columbia University, and although emeritus, I understand, is busier than ever, uh, former director of the Weatherhead East Asia Centre uh, at Columbia University, and an eminent speaker uh, on Japanese politics, electoral processes, uh, foreign policy, and uh, wider questions of Japan's place in the world. So without any further ado, could I please hand over to Penendra to okay. kick us off? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I would also like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to uh, this Japan update. Um, well, I have been asked to kick off, and also I was told that I have got five minutes uh, to start with, and then we will enter into Q&A later on. Uh, I want to, actually, I, I was, want to start with by borrowing two terms uh, from the world of business. Uh, one of the, uh, them is uh, what we call uh, disruption, uh, innovative disruptions. Uh, how companies like Apple, uh, they have disrupted the traditional market. Uh, two, uh, the other uh, term I want to borrow is networking. Again, from the world of business, uh, we network. Uh, and I want to relate uh, these two terms to what's happening uh, with Japan's security and the strategic uh, policy, uh, and how uh, Japan has been strategically challenged uh, because of these strategic disruptions, and how Japan is dealing with those strategic disruptions and uh, one of the uh, explanations uh, which I have uh, followed or written and trying to follow a little bit more and explain is by uh, creating uh, uh, what I call networks, uh, international global networks. So what are these strategic challenges or disruptions which Japan is currently facing? Uh, we all know and we have heard so much about China, we have heard about North Korea, uh, but these are not the only uh, disruptions which Japan is, is facing. Uh, there are others. For example, uh, Japan's view that the U.S. Uh, is uh, weakening, and this is kind of world view in terms of its economic, uh, uh, economic influence, and to a certain degree its uh, diplomatic and military influence. Uh, then there are a rise of others. Uh, for example, here I want to bring India uh, in the picture, in the equation. Uh, so all these things, uh, if you put them together, 
Japan has never faced, faced this kind of uh, challenges, these kinds of challenges which Japan is facing now. I mean, Japan used to be in the 1970s and 80s the leader, the regional leader. Uh, but Japan has become kind of a regional uh, player. And in this uh, region, we have brought so many other players, and some are of uh, greater consequences uh, than what Japan uh, uh, is about. And, and, and this, um, Japan is trying to deal with, as I said, through forming networks. And I just had a look at the number of countries uh, which Mr. Abe has visited uh, since he became prime minister. It's just amazing. Uh, about 50 uh, different uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, visits with up close to 90 countries which he has visited in the last uh, three years or so, uh, three and a half years since he became prime minister. And you may remember, uh, in the early 1960s, uh, when Prime Minister Ikeda uh, went to Europe, or he was traveling uh, throughout the world, uh, famously or infamously, uh, the president of France uh, branded him as a transistor salesperson. <laughs> uh, and then Japan was characterized as an economic animal. And I was just thinking what Mr. Abe is trying to say, what Mr. Abe is trying to do through his visits to these many countries around the world and to almost all the continents. Uh, Abe is trying to sell his diplomacy. And this diplomacy, through selling his diplomacy, he is trying to create these what I call diplomatic networks. And now I give you some examples. Uh, for example, uh, as you said, that uh, you know, um, U.S. It, uh, as Professor Curtis in the morning, he mentioned that uh, you know the U.S. expects now its uh, allies uh, to do more, and perhaps it will uh, expect the allies to do more, um, even further. Uh, so, what Mr. Abe uh, or the LDP or government has done. If you look at the kinds of strategic networks which Japan is, is building, and you know, for the first time in 2007, uh, there was a security agreement with Australia, for example. Uh, one year after that, uh, there was a security agreement with India, and there are so many strategic partnership agreements which Mr. Abe recently has signed that I have lost count. So he is creating that kind of strategic network. And India and Australia, I give you two examples. The other aspect, uh, perhaps we don't hear much or we heard in the past, but it has become very important in my analysis uh, particularly, is Japan's um, foreign aid. Uh, in the late 1980s, um, uh, Japan was uh, kind of dubbed uh, aid superpower. Uh, Japan no longer is aid superpower because Japan doesn't have, we have heard uh, from uh, the panel experts previously about how the Japanese economy uh, is stagnating or not performing very well, and the budget is shrinking. So Japan doesn't have that kind of uh, money to throw around on its foreign aid. But what one could see very clearly that the aid money is being utilized very strategically. And this strategic aid, or the characteristic of aid, which is becoming very strat strategic, one could see very clearly through many examples. Uh, one of them, perhaps, uh, may be well known, is that how Japan is using its aid money to provide patrol boats or surveillance aircraft uh, to countries like Vietnam or to the Philippines and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, since my origin is uh, India, I always follow what's happening in Japan and India as well. Uh, very recently, uh, Mr. Abe not only uh, committed $10 billion uh, uh, towards a bullet train project in India, uh, but uh, actually, he has signed other kinds of agreements uh, which are very strategic in nature. And one of the examples is uh, India's northeast, part northeast, which is especially the state of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, which China claims as its own territory. And now Japan is trying to help build infrastructure roads 
uh, connecting India's Northeast to Southeast Asia through Myanmar and so on and so forth. Uh, so if we look at some of these examples, uh, what uh, Mr. Abe in particular in the last three years and also in his previous uh, uh, position as Prime Minister in 2006 7 uh, if you look at all those things, it's very clear that uh, Japan is trying to create these kind of uh, strategic networks. And that brings me one more point. I know my time is, has run out. Uh, if you look at uh, only this month, actually, uh, it's called TICAD, which is the Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Uh, which uh, Japan started in 1993, way back before China or India thought about engaging uh, Africa. Uh, so Japan started that way back in 1993. You remember it was kind of just after the uh, you know uh, first Gulf War, and uh, you know nations were struggling with their economies and so on and so forth. And uh, Japan uh, decided to engage Africa. Now, for the first time uh, in its history since 1993, what Mr. Abe did was to take Thaikad from Japan to Africa. So for the first time, it was held on African soil. And this move is, in my analysis, is very, very strategic because, and he committed 30 billion, 30 billion US dollars in public and private uh, and public and private capital uh, to help uh, Africa's development. And this was to match uh, Xi Jinping's $60 billion which Xi Jinping uh, uh, last year had committed to Africa. But the point is that Mr. Abe's strategy is not about what the Chinese are doing, but what Abe is saying that it is about partnership. It is about uh, developing <coughs> uh, Africa uh, as a partner. So the term which I use is Abe, uh, Mr. Abe is creating horizontal network. It's not kind of vertical networks which uh, Japan created in the past or which Japan remains in that kind of vertical network with the US. So Japan is trying to create this more kind of horizontal network. And Abe has emphasized about quality, quality infrastructure. And quality infrastructure such as bullet train in India, quality infrastructure for Africa. And all these things, and if you put together, uh, this, the final point I want to make is how our Mr. Abe is trying to uh, give some uh, flesh to the bones of these strategic engagement is the project is to change the Constitution. Right? And the change the Constitution means change Article 9 of the Constitution uh, to make it more formal what Japan is doing or what Japan intends to do. But I think that's a point uh, uh, which we can come back on about the changing the amendment of the Constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, a terrific start, I think, to think about those sort of strategic disruptions to Japan and its uh, its policies in the region, uh, and some of the sort of signature moves that Abe is making in terms of networking, use of foreign aid, and some of the ways in which that is differing from uh, from China. Uh, Yamaguchi-san, over yes. to you. Um, does it work? Yep. Is it working? Okay, thank you. First of all, I have to apologize for my voice. Uh, my, my, I'm recovering from uh, the slight surgery of my throat a couple of, uh, several weeks ago. My voice, um, original voice, much, much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I, have been, I have been learning a lot from this morning, from optimistic side to, to very pessimistic side. And I belong to the former. I, I was trained as a helicopter pilot to be optimistic. So I never thought my plane was going to, to have an engine failure. Even if I, I had an engine failure, I thought I was going to save the plane by auto rotation, force landing. If I was not able to save the plane, I won't be, I won't be injured. Even if I got injured, I won't, uh, won't be killed. When I got killed, I, I, I don't realize it. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a basically an optimist, and uh, today I'm going to, to uh, have a very daunting task, um, very much daunting, in five minutes. Uh, 
I'm going to talk about new legislation uh, about uh, Japanese security policy. And March 29th of this year, a new se a s a set of new laws uh, came to effect. Um, th this uh, is a very drastic change uh, of the national security policy um, based on the laws, and 10 laws are amended, and one new law uh, was uh, enacted. Don't worry, I, I'm not going to say all the 10 laws and, uh, and, and new laws, even a title. Title may take uh, five, more than five minutes. <laughs> but basically, what I'm saying is uh, we expanded the mission areas of the self-defense forces by, by, uh, by putting something within, within the existing, uh, the old uh, set of laws and policy set. And while amending, amending the changing of the interpretation of constitution um, by adding very, very little uh, part. Uh, let me start with uh, um, um, you know, putting what we, I call, um, my generation know, knows that you know, Tom and Jerry, uh, Captain, Captain Run, you know, Chase, and, uh, Chase and Run, and I, 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 I used to, uh, to uh, I keep uh, telling my students that the new laws put, uh, uh, put something in the openings uh, within the cheese, Swiss cheese, which has holes, <laughs> and in the meantime, putting a little bit of uh, cream maybe on, on top. <laughs> And the putting uh, putting putting things in in hope um, includes ex expanding expanding uh, the uh, you know, right uh, authority to use weapons, and uh, even under all interpretation, we SDF members were allowed to use weapons to protect our weapons uh, because you know bad guys takes it and take it. It it is very very dangerous and. You know, weapons are expensive, so we are allowed to uh, we are allowed to protect those weapons. And, and uh, you know, this this was expanded to include the use of uh, weapons to protect other countries' weapons, uh, weapon systems that might be used for protection of Japanese population. Uh, for instance, U.S. U.S. Uh, U.S. forces the weapons in in Japan or any any other any other forces uh, that might be uh, protecting us. Uh, we can use weapons uh, weapons to protect them under even under peacetime uh, conditions. And um, another point is that we uh, expanded uh, expanded the mission areas uh, in terms of international missions. By by loosening or uh, by lifting some of the limits. Uh, for example, um, we were not allowed to to do what we call kaketsuke keigo. Uh, that means um, no, we can we use weapons to protect me and protect you if you you are working with uh, me uh, for in, in the UN peacekeeping operations uh, from the beginning, uh, 1992. But if you know, the next you know, guy, the people are asking me to help. I was not able to allow to, to go and help. Uh, so uh, therefore, those kinds of missions which might uh, cause that kind of situation is what we, uh, the government of Japan, um, did not have, did not take. Because you know, if uh, I, I I am asked, uh, if I have, have to say no, it is embarrassing. And it is uh, it may have a negative uh, negative impact. So we were really hesitant to, to take that sort of uh, mission. But now we, we can do that. Uh, several other cases uh, included. In addition, um, you know, a little bit uh, um, the cream over top of the cheese uh, is a new interpretation of constitution, which allows us to to exercise exercise right of collective self-defense in the very, very limited case. Um, up until uh, the last, last March, uh, Japan was supposed to use force uh, for just only for individual self-defense, uh, for defense of Japan. But now, if something happens next to us, and uh, if, uh, if Japan let it, lets it go as it is, um, Japan uh, might be in serious danger of e existence. In such a case, um, even before, uh, before being attacked, we can use force uh, to, to, uh, to save others. 
Um, Abe, I'm not representing the government anymore. I used to be the part of the government for 45 years. I decided uh, it was long, <laughs> long enough. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm now a, uh, full, I'm now a private citizen with full-fledged uh, freedom of uh, speech. So I, I can say this: that station, that that uh, cheese, maybe uh, cream on the top, top of the cheese, maybe the case, uh, something like September 1950. After several months after the Korean War broke out, uh, Pusan perimeter was almost too full. If that happens again, and if uh, uh, Pusan perimeter um, falls, Japan's uh, Kyushu is going to be the uh, front line, and um, Japan uh, will be uh, under the very, very serious situation. So in such a case, uh, we, might, uh, we might be able to, to, uh, to participate in international efforts uh, to, to save that so sort of situation. Then uh, my conclusion is the very simple as simple as soldiers. <laughs> we have, since 1992, uh, when we dispatched the uh, first ever peacekeeping operations uh, missions to Cambodia, uh, up until now, we have come a very, very long way. But still, we have a long way to go. Um, one example is uh, new legislation does not touch upon the what we call collective security. And that means uh, under the UN Charter, Ch uh, Charter 7, Chapter 7, if uh, somebody is uh, doing something really nasty, everybody is uh, going to standing up against, uh, against uh, him or her. Uh, that is collective security. That's why uh, I am uh, refrained from doing stupid things against Amy. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, if that, that, that has, uh, that uh, comes through. In, in other words, if UN force, UN United Nations force uh, is organized to do to do good thing for the world, uh, you know, the international community should work uh, very very hard. But the, the, the new legislation did not touch upon this. In the future, we might have to to look at the, that area as well. As well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I think that's really highlighted, uh, helpfully, some of the specifics uh, around the new security legislation. Um, and you've opened up, I think, some areas that we'll want to discuss further about where Japan might go next. Jerry, do you want to finish us off with uh, some thoughts? <laughs> well, I don't really don't because uh, it's kind of difficult. I, I don't want to repeat what I said this morning, and I don't want to repeat what these two gentlemen have said now, with, with uh, which I agree. So I will, I don't, uh, maybe I won't even need the, the five minutes, but I, I want to sort of build a little bit on something I said this morning, which was when we think about Japanese security policy, <clears throat> we have to understand it's not Prime Minister Abe so much that's driving the policy, it's the changes in the international system that the end of bipolarity, the end of that time we thought was America's unipolar uh, position as the, as, the, as the only superpower. Now that's gone and we're, we've entered a fluid, uncertain, dangerous uh, phase of transitioning towards some sort, some new form of, of a multilateral system in East Asia. And we have to think about how that is changing the dynamics of Japanese security policy thinking, and particularly from my perspective, how it's changing the U.S.-Japan relationship. So it's on that latter point I want to say a few words, really about how it's changing, I think, U.S. thinking. There is no one U.S. thinking about Japan, but in the United States, there are trends about thinking about our relations with allies and our relations with Japan in particular that are different, that are new to, the rela to, the, to our relationship. And I am concerned that policymakers in Washington don't necessarily get it and that actions that they take may come up against the fact that what worked in the past isn't necessarily going to work now in the present. So there are two points in particular I want to make. One relates to the so-called free ride. 
Ever since John Foster Dulles negotiated the San Francisco Peace Treaty with uh, Prime Minister Yoshida, uh, uh, and Japan adopted its post-war constitution with an article that prohibits it from having a military, <clears throat> Americans have complained about Japan getting a free ride. We have an asymmetrical uh, uh, security relationship in which we're obligated to come to Japan's defense. And even though there's been some very significant progress made in terms of Japanese commitments through the, uh, the new guidelines, the adoption of the, the reinterpretation of the Constitution to permit collective defense, from the point of view of a lot of Americans, Japan is still getting a free ride. And when Donald Trump said on TV, that we have an alliance with Japan where we're, out, we're obligated to, um, to come to Japan's assistance if it's attacked. And if we're attacked, Japanese can sit and watch it on their Sony TV. This resonated with a lot of people in, in the United States. Uh, uh, so the idea that Japan should do more now has a lot to do with the fact that Americans feel we're being um, st stressed because we're asked to do much, so much when, for, when other countries now have the ability to do more. Uh, uh, and that um, uh, it's, if, if the Japanese have a security concern, they should be stepping up to the bat more. I don't want to exaggerate it. I don't want to exaggerate it, uh, but it's, a, it's an important shift. I think the pressure, as I said earlier, on Japan to do more to contribute to the alliance, uh, not only in terms of money, but in terms of roles and missions. You know, when Prime Minister Abe was in Washington in April of last year, the time of the guidelines, the new guidelines be adopted, when he spoke at Congress, he was very bullish about what the reinterpretation of the, inter of the Constitution and the new guidelines meant for Japan's uh, role, mil potential military role. And Secretary Kerry s very enthusiastically said at a press conference uh, while Abe was, st was still in town, Japan is now committed to come to the assistance of, to, to come to the defense of American territory. Of, of, uh, 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 that, uh, that's what he said, of America, of America. So Japan's committed to defend us as we are to defend them. And then Abe walked us back a lot to get the bill through, through, the, through the diet, because the, the political support uh, was, not, was not there. So uh, how we manage this relationship from here on forward uh, is, requires some different thinking than I think it did in the past. We want Japan to do more. I think that's a general feeling in the US. But we want Japan to do more of what we want Japan to do. And it's not necessarily the case that Japan will want to do what we want to do, and they might want us to do what they want us to do. And we had not. We have not much experience with having to respond to doing, to figure out whether we're going to do what Japan wants us to do, or with a Japan that's doing things that we don't necessarily want them to do, like Abe's, what I think is a good initiative uh, towards, uh, toward, towards Russia. So just keep these, I think we have to keep these things in mind, and I hope American policymakers keep them in mind. And just one uh, particular uh, a point about what we want Japan to do. And because I'm interested in, in reactions from some of the security specialists in the audience. The, ish, the, the concern over China's uh, aggressive bullying behavior in the South China Sea and the East China Sea is a major concern for all of us. And the US has been, not, I don't think doing enough, but it has been doing a freedom of navigation operations in, uh, around these islands that, the, you know, the artificial islands the Chinese have, have created in the, in, the South, in the South China Sea. But do we want Japan to join uh, an FL, FON operation? There's a lot of people in the United States who think, yeah, you know, Japan, these, these sea lanes are important to Japan, Japan too. I think it's very dangerous. 
It's very dangerous. And you know the Chinese will try to find out where is the, the weak link if there's multilateral efforts in, in, to, 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 do, to do these uh, FON operations in the South China Sea. And they may well conclude that the weak link is the Senkaku Islands. And you can see the Chinese responding to Japanese participation in a freedom of navigation operation in the South China Sea by upping the ante vis-a-vis -vis the Senkaku Islands. Then what is the US going to do? These issues need to be thought through um, uh, in, in ways that we haven't thought about before. The second point I want to, I want to stress is this. You know, after the war, and actually, until until through the 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 the, uh, the, the debate and the diet over the the, um, the the security legislation, the Japanese had a great concern, which was that alliance with the United States raised the danger of entanglement. The Americans would do something and drag the Japanese into it when they didn't want to be part of it. So you know in this alliance theory there's the danger of entanglement and there's danger of abandonment. I don't think the Japanese ever, ever worried that we would abandon Japan, but they did worry about getting, that they would get entangled by our actions. <clears throat> For the US, we didn't worry about Either. We didn't really count on the Japanese to do very much, so it wasn't a question of being abandoned. And the Japanese weren't doing anything that was going to entangle us. But this has changed. This is something that's very important to understand. When Abe visited Yasukuni, the end of 2013, the US government issued a statement, the, the State Department issued a statement of disappointment. Our disappointment was not the disappointment of the Koreans and the Chinese, we're ang which were not disappointed, angry that Abe visited a shrine that, pay, that, uh, that enshrined the souls of convicted war criminals. This is not a big issue for Americans. The big issue for the Americans was that Abe did something that raised tensions in East Asia and dragged, they raised the danger of entangling us in a conflict that we don't want any part of if we can avoid it. So it's very critical that so, so this, this danger of entanglement is no, no longer only a Japanese concern. It is an American concern. And as the Japanese are asked to do more, and do do more, they will want to do more about deciding what it is that we do jointly. And as they do so, it raises the, the possible dangers that we'll be asked to do things we don't necessarily want to get involved in. All I'm trying to stress here is that this relationship requires, the, the US-Japan bilateral relationship, requires a level of attention uh, and knowledge and from the top level of, uh, levels of American decision makers that I don't think we have ever had to deal with. And I don't think we're prepared to deal with it. I don't believe, frankly, well, God only knows that Donald Trump is the last person you want to be in a position of responsibility to have to deal with it. But I don't think Hillary Clinton gets it either. That's my, uh, that, 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 that's, that, that's my, that's my sense. Well, there's other things to talk about, but I mean, I'm gonna stop there okay. and let's get the audience to get involved. Terrific, thank you. What you've just said prompts some questions, but then I'm going to turn to each of Penendra and Yamaguchi-san with some questions based on their presentations as well. But, Jerry, this morning you talked about public opinion perhaps being the last real the, the last real check and balance on Abe in terms of some of the national security policies and constitutional revision uh, that, he's, that he uh, is taking. Uh, the opposition is not that constrained any longer. The media perhaps not that constrained. So public opinion is an important constraint. But there's also another constraint, I guess, on Japan doing more in security in terms of what the US might want, and that is China, and perhaps to a lesser extent South Korea. Um, they don't see Japan doing more in a security sense as being perhaps legitimate. How is Abe going in managing those two sets of constraints, the public opinion one and the, 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 the two most important regional neighbors question? Do you think he is... Uh, doing what he needs to do to engage the neighbors and public opinion to, to manage that sort of national secure, security direction that he wants to take the country in? That's a good question. I would say there's a third constraint, which is Abe's perception of what is, his perception of what's in Japanese interest is itself a constraint mm -hmm. because he does not perceive 
it to be in Japan's interest to, to, to do things that will raise tensions with China um, uh, unnecessarily. And I think so far, on the point I mentioned earlier about the freedom of navigation operations, the Japanese government um, has, has not uh, uh, expressed any, any intent of, of, of participating, and I hope they continue uh, with that position. About, I don't think, <clears throat> China, what China thinks, I don't think is a constraint on Japan. What China is, and what it's capable of doing is a constraint. Uh, but I think Abe, uh, compared to the Abe I've known in the past, I once did a TV, had a TV debate with Abe about, about China politics. This is what he was, I think maybe between his times, as, as the first time as prime minister and the second. And he was so hawkish and so hardline. And, and when the debate, when the TV program ended, we went back to the makeup room, take off our makeup, we continued to have um, a rather heated uh, discussion. And he, which ended with him saying to me, you know, Japan has never kowtowed to China, and it never will. And we will defend ourselves. And I, that's what I'm, I'm sure, that, and that is what he believes. But he, over the last two years, he has been very cautious in dealing with the Chinese, I think. Uh, he's been very firm about the Senkaku Islands, uh, but he's also been enthusiastic about having face-to-face -face, uh, conversations with, with Xi Jinping, about encouraging greater Chinese tourism into Japan, which is, uh, which is huge, about uh, trying to uh, develop a more economic relations. So I don't think it's what, so I think Abe is dealing with, it, with, the, with the Chinese that way. Um, so the major constraints on what he, um, what he does, um, it's not what Chinese think. South Korea, I think actually, despite all the, the, the bad rhetoric between the two, um, um, increasingly have their own concerns about China, and I think are, uh, see, as long as Japan is closely tied to the U.S. in its security policy, that that more a, a larger Japanese role and greater multilateral uh, 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 activities, including with Australia and so on, I don't think the South Koreans have a problem a problem with that. So yes, the major constraint. A major constraint is public opinion, but you know, Japanese public opinion on this issue has changed in a very important way. If you look at the numbers, yes, most people oppose the reinterpretation of the Constitution about, about collective defense, don't want to see revision of Article 9, um, uh, they didn't like the Classified Secrets Act, but compare it to the past, compare it to 1960, at the time of the security treaty crisis, when people came out in large numbers, in massive demonstrations, some violent demonstrations, to try to stop this from happening. Do you see that, the intensity of the opposition anymore? No, the intensity is not there. So what you have now in public opinion is a lot of acquiescence. People didn't like the Classified Securities Act, and Bob Abe's popularity went down when it passed. A month later, it was back up to where it was before. They didn't like the collective defense reinterpretation of the Constitution, and the same thing happened. He's up there somewhere in the high 50s in terms of, of popularity, in spite of having done all of this. So I don't think public opinion is as much of a constraint on what uh, the prime minister, uh, what the Japanese, the Japanese government does. The key issue is how, the, how sophisticated the leadership is in trying, in figuring out a strategy to deal with this fluid, multilateral um, uh, transition, um, system, systemic transition in East Asia. I think so far, so good mm -hmm. is, is my conclusion. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yamaguchi-san, on this question about public opinion, and uh, you sort of said that we'd, we'd, we'd gotten somewhere with the collective security legislation, but there was a lot further to go. How do you see that changing? Uh, what, what could change the public attitudes towards these new operations for the SDF? Yeah, 
actually, um, for, for example, the expanded the mission areas um, may include something more, more, uh, more active. Mm -hmm. And the, in the peacekeeping operations, for, for example, for instance, in South Sudan, we have troops, uh, a couple of hundred troops, along with Chinese and Koreans. Now we are doing the same, the same job. And uh, uh, Chinese, for the first time, uh, sent a uh, combat unit, uh, for the first ever combat uh, infantry unit to South Sudan for protection of uh, those uh, activities. In such cases, uh, we need to work harder. Mm -hmm. And in such cases, you know, our soldier and soldier relations are really good. And uh, Koreans and Chinese, we, we got along with uh, quite well. Uh, since 1992, uh, we started peacekeeping operation in Cam Cambodia with Chinese engineer battalion next to, next to you know, almost shoulder to shoulder. Uh, since then, uh, we have the you know, tension over the Senkaku or you know, differences in the pol political position over international uh, rules. Uh, but we have a uh, common thing, uh, too. So in that sense, um, we may have to have wider views um, on the relation with neighbors. And as to Koreans, um, Japanese and Korean, Koreans, that, that I'm a private citizen, so I can say this, that uh, they are both Japanese and Koreans have got tired of beating each other. Mm -hmm. So basically, we are ready to, to, to work, uh, work together again. That is my feeling. Uh, during the time, uh, the Korean-Japanese uh, relations were not good uh, in the last maybe three, four years. I never declined uh, any opportunity uh, to be invited to Seoul or Beijing. Mm -hmm. And I tried to do my best with my colleagues in uh, Korea and China. <coughs> and now, you know, the reaction of uh, Chinese, Chinese media, uh, Korean media, um, are totally different from uh, that of uh, two, uh, two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. So uh, we may have to find common, common things while um, we may have to, to uh, be clear that you know, we, ha we have differences uh, and we, we cannot tolerate, uh, you know, tolerate the violation of uh, common international rules, that sort of thing. But uh, it's a sort of you know, complicated world mm -hmm. and, um, which we are facing. And uh, this is uh, not my mission to think about the future, that it's <laughs> the younger generation's mission. <laughs> <laughs> we trust you. <laughs> Thank you. Penendra, I mean, one of the ways in which Abe is trying to deal with this more complicated world, as you said, is uh, this network approach. And sort of he's, he's going around the, the region selling his new diplomacy networks. Does the region want what he's selling? And particularly in Southeast Asia, and are there limits to what Abe is trying to do? Yeah, I mean, what the narrative of Abe's salesmanship is still pacifism. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know that Japan moved uh, from passive pacifism to active pacifism. And that narrative of active pacifism has become proactive contribution to peace. So this is what Abe is trying to sell, right? And he is trying to project. And it's not just selling to the uh, foreign audience, uh, but also to his domestic audience. Uh, what Mr. Abe is saying that, look, whatever we are doing is, to, is for preserving peace. And whether it is collective security, whether it is uh, rescuing operations, whether it is through ODA or giving uh, rescue boats or surveillance aircraft, uh, these all act, these all kinds of activities are, um, you know, put in the context of Japan's pacifist, peaceful uh, ideas. Uh, so he's not saying, and um, so in other words, there is uh, there are takers of this. That's one point. The other point is that uh, we have already talked about it, and I think this point will come up in Q and A. Uh, that uh, many of the Southeast Asian nations, if not all, uh, they want some kind of balance in the region, and they see uh, China's influence being uh, too pervasive, uh, too strong. Uh, so how to moderate uh, that influence of China? And they see Japan uh, as the best possible uh, country 
uh, which can bring that kind of moderation. Uh, so yes, uh, I think uh, through my travels and uh, talks with uh, my colleagues in Malaysia and Indonesia and Singapore, I get this impression very strongly uh, that they more or less uh, they are in support of uh, what Japan is trying to do and achieve. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think just to add uh, to what Dundra just said, uh, Abe probably could write a thank you note to Xi Jinping for having, for helping him so much to improve relations with the countries in Southeast Asia. Uh, because it's because of everybody's concern about Chinese behavior that, uh, that Japan is not only expanding its economic and cultural political relations, but it's expanding security relations with Vietnam, with the Philippines, with Australia. Japan is a popular country in Southeast Asia. You know, the, the, the historical, the, this problem of history that has bedeviled Japan's relations with China and South Korea, bedevils the relations with Korea and with, with China and South Korea. But when you get beyond that into the rest of, of, of Asia, it's not that people don't have uh, memories uh, of what happened in the war, but it's not, it does, it's not the same. When you go as far as India, you know, it, it's, not, it's not an issue uh, at all. Uh, but China's the issue. China's the issue. And so uh, the countries in the region are looking, I think, to Japan. And Abe may phrase it as, uh, you know, pacifist or peaceful, positive contribution and so on. Look, he wants Japan to be more of a so-called normal country and have security relationships with countries that are on China's periphery or that can help him um, be sure that a balance in East Asia can be maintained even if the U.S role in it declines somewhat. So this is what, uh, what, he's, what he's about. Um, and um, uh, so we're seeing kind of a, a new honeymoon in Japan's relations with a lot of countries in, in, in Southeast Asia. Now I want to make sure we have plenty of time for your sure. questions. So I'm going to hand over to the floor now. Um, I'll take as many as we possibly can, but if you want to grab my attention, I'll um, try to keep a, a, a bit of a, an eye out. So if you could please uh, identify yourself, say your name and where you're from, that would also be helpful. Uh, so we'll go first to the gentleman here. Thank you for having me. My name is Rudolf, I'm a master's student. My question is to Professor Jen. Uh, can you give us insights into uh, Prime Minister Abe's diplomatic networks in Central Asia, especially after the withdrawal of the uh, U.S. troops in Afghanistan? Uh, I think uh, Japan has been trying to get uh, the SCO membership for long. So can you give us insights into that? Okay, um, I mean Japan is certainly now, as we have heard from this panel as well, I mean it's expanding and it's uh, uh, partnership and friendship and what I call networks, and Central Asia comes very much in that picture. And one of the reasons is that, you know, like China is quite strong, and India's influence is not, I mean, it's not weak. Uh, so China and India have been uh, two players, and I'm not talking about Russia so much. Uh, but Japan's interest is in Central Asia is rising, and this is, because of, I call it a number game. Uh, Mr. Abe is after having as many friends, as many interlocutors as possible. And Central Asia comes very much in, in that uh, context. Uh, but more than Central Asia, actually, I think we should think more of South Asia uh, here because uh, you know we have heard this expression about uh, a string of pearls. Uh, uh, around the Indian subcontinent, uh, influence of uh, China in Pakistan, influence of China in Sri Lanka and Nepal. Uh, and there, uh, we see that India has, um, has become a, a very important partner of Japan. I mean, it, it, in 1998, when uh, India tested its nuclear uh, device, uh, Japan was one of the strongest uh, critics of uh, India's act and put sanctions on India. 
by two years later or three years later, uh, it started with exchange of not only with prime ministers, but also defense level exchanges, which never happened in the past. So one can see very clearly that it's not just Mr. Abe, I'm talking about Mr. Modi as prime minister uh, at that time, uh, who took this initiative of engaging uh, India. And I think uh, the signs were very clear that they regarded that uh, South Asia, India in particular, is a very important, uh, going to be a very important player. And that's why we see there is more strategic security and defense kinds of relationship with India than with economics and trade and investment, which is quite unusual. Uh, you see kind of bilateral engagement, more economic and more trade and investment followed by these kinds of things, the transition engagement relationship has been very uh, different. Uh, but sure, to answer your question, the yes, relation has become very, very important in Japan's world view. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, so we'll go to Murray, and then um, what I might do is take a couple of questions, so Murray, and then we'll go to Manuel. Uh, Peter. Um, actually, I was going to really just going to make a comment in particular, um, leading uh, particularly from what Jared said, but also from what um, that Professor Jane also said earlier. Um, and that is really, I completely agree that it's very unusual for a Japanese Prime Minister to have visited so many countries and he's got out there very deliberately to ensure that Japan's uh, face is there in Southeast Asia and more broadly, of course, um, in Africa and elsewhere. And that's all very important from Japan's own self-respect, its own uh, image uh, generally, and all the rest. And Japan will be able to continue to do that uh, in spite of the increasing um, uh, weight of China in the region, uh, which is really what I'm about to get onto. And that is essentially, um, I think that all of this is very nice. India is, to a certain extent, doing some of the same thing, and that's important. But I think China's really playing a long game. They're playing the game that really is to diminish um, the influence of the United States and its allies generally in the region. And they don't really care how they are seen. Uh, they, can, they are seen as the power in the region. That's what they want to be. Uh, if you go back in history, obviously they have had tributary states in Indochina and, and elsewhere, and that's actually how they'd like things to be in the long term. And um, the situation, therefore, I think, is one where they will put up with some rough rides, uh, say from Vietnam or the Philippines under the former president, not under the current one, um, and uh, uh, as long as they using effectively 19th century gunboat style diplomacy to establish their uh, position as uh, the power, the greater influence in the region than uh, preferably even the United States. Uh, and I think that's really what they're on about. And they don't really care what Southeast Asia and the others think because they, will, they, they believe that with their economic uh, might and uh, increasing uh, military uh, uh, projection that they can achieve that outcome. So that's just my my take on the situation. Sorry, it's pessimistic. It's cold, hard, uh, realist though. <laughs> so before I let you respond, if you want to, we'll go to Manuel and then to Peter. Uh, yeah, Manuel uh, Giotopoulos. Uh, this is primarily to Jerry. Uh, it's based on your speech this morning, which is fantastic. One of my 45 questions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'd say that the word that most, has been most frequently used today from the morning till now is Abe. And I'd like you to tell me what you think would happen if completely unexpectedly Mr. Abe was removed from the political scene tomorrow. What would happen in Kante? What would happen in the LDP? What would happen in Japan? Thank you. And Peter. Uh, my question is on a different tack, really, but uh, uh, I, I want to go back to the last session and connect it with this session because uh, I think pretty obviously uh, the political security outlook for Japan 
and strategy must be connected a bit with the economic outlook for Japan. And what we took away from the last session on the economic outlook was, uh, well, the most optimistic outlook we took away from Hayakawa and Vines was that we've got an economy which is facing a very, very low potential rate of growth. Uh, David was sanguine about the risks either of uh, an inflation breakout or uh, a recession in the medium to longer term, uh, but they're not inconsiderable risks. Uh, whichever is not good for Japan, not good for Japan's friends in Asia, and not good for the region. Uh, and uh, if uh, the more optimistic uh, conclusion is a genteel decline, it really means that in relative terms, but also absolutely, uh, Japan's clout and standing in political terms and security terms is diminished. So uh, I want to put a question to Jeremy and to the others too about you know, what that means for Japan's foreign and security policy options and the conduct of its foreign and security policy, especially in the region. When uh, the flip side of the conclusion from the last session is that you know, the increased importance of, of GNP or GNI means that Japan's stake in the multilateral system is bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, so if you're, you know, the new leader of the DP in Japan, Jerry, you know, how would you define uh, a foreign policy strategy that's attractive to the Japanese electorate, however it's shifting over time, that could carry a persuasive case for meeting those circumstances, not only in Japan domestically, but in the international uh, scene that it has to confront. So we've had a question, obviously, on, on how we manage uh, Japanese foreign and security policy given those economic circumstances. Uh, one on uh, what happens if no more are there. Uh, and, and perhaps a response um, to uh, this idea that China is playing a game that Japan is not really up to right now in terms of uh, a, ch a more China-centric order and, and whether uh, our base strategy can actually handle that. So, Jerry, we might start with you. If, uh, I'd like to give Fernando and then we'll give you some opportunity to respond as well. Okay, well, they're all, all great questions and tough to answer. First, about you know, basically China playing the long game to dominate the region. Uh, Point. Well, I think that's I think that's true, but I don't want to be as pessimistic as I think uh, uh, you are. After all, the Chinese to play the long game, their economy has to be healthy, and that's very difficult to imagine if they have a bad relationship with both the United States and with Japan, two major uh, uh, investors and, and trading and trading partners. And what the Chinese are trying to do. The last couple of years. Thank you. So where where was I? <laughs> uh, I well, I actually do remember where I was. Uh, uh, so I think the Chinese tried to play a game of driving a wedge between the U.S. and Japan and isolate, uh, isolate Japan. Um, and they were helped by this history uh, issue uh, and by uh, Abe's visit uh, to Yasukuni. But once Obama went to Tokyo, on his way to China actually, and said in Tokyo, what has been American policy all along, but said it in Tokyo, that the Senkaku Islands comes under Article 5 of the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. In fact, you know, don't mess with the Japanese on this issue because you'll have to mess with us. I think that did a lot to convince the Chinese that this wedge strategy wasn't going to work. So I think if we coordinate, uh, and more broadly than just U.S.-Japan, but U.S.-Japan, Korea, Australia, and other countries, in trying to 
impress on the Chinese. If they want to be successful economically, they have to get along with us. And if they keep on playing the game they're playing now, it will not serve their interests. We're obviously not making a lot of progress in getting that message across, but that is the message uh, to continue to continue to give. And to hope that if we can play for time, over time, China will evolve. That all these Chinese who are studying here and in Japan and the United States, where they going back and when they're in when they're in their 30s and 40s and have influence in in, in the country, that uh, you know you can hope that what we saw happen in Taiwan, what we saw happen in Korea, what we've seen happening happening in this part of the world in terms of the evolution of political systems, it's not going. I don't want to be optimistic, but I want to be hopeful. So I, I, I think that's that's where that is. And now, what if Abe? What happens if Abe were to go tomorrow? One reason why he's likely to get a third term as prime minister is Japanese don't want to think about what would happen if he goes because they, he's a known quantity. And people are pretty comfortable, I think, now with Abe, unlike three years ago when there was a lot of nervousness about him. I think a lot of that has gone. Um, uh, but as I said this morning, if he were to go, the next person might not be as effective, at least not initially. Um, uh, uh, but I don't see any fundamental change in what this foreign policy strategy would be. I think this, what you see is what you're going to get for some time to come. And if by chance, um, uh, the Democratic Party came to power, which is really, as I said, the only thing more inconceivable than them coming to power, I hope, is Trump coming to power. But, um, but even if that would happen and someone like you know, Prime Minister Noda were back uh, in an important position, it would be very much the same because this is being driven by <coughs> national interests. Japan's national interest is not to let the Chinese dominate the region if they can help it. They can't do as much about it on their own, but they're surely trying hard to do it together with the U.S. and with other countries uh, countries in, in, in the region. But there will be some differences, to be certain. Um, uh, well, I don't want to go, I don't want to, I can talk about individuals, but there's no point at, at this point doing that now. But it's the same point about the, the point that, that Peter raised about, you know, so what are the, what would you do if you were the head of, if I were the head of the opposition party, um, uh, given Japan's economic stake in the multilateral order and so on? I would do what Abe is doing. And I think that's what the Democratic Party would do. I don't see, um, I don't see on the foreign, I think on the foreign policy side, there's much more of a bipartisan consensus than people are willing to admit. And I thought what was really so disappointing about the diet debate over the, the national security legislation was that the Democratic Party didn't want to debate the foreign policy issues, they wanted to debate Article 9. Uh, rather than what national what the national security what national interests would would require, because I think they pretty much agree with Abe about that. So I don't see big changes, uh, even if you had a change of 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 of, of leadership in in the country. Okay. Andrew, do you want to comment on any of those? Questions? Yeah, just uh, about uh, Peter's comment on the relationship between economic and strategic uh, orientation of Japan. You are absolutely right there. Uh, but I don't, I mean, Japan has got, in my view, a strength in the region, which still many other countries don't have. And Japan is still is uh, the region's uh, second largest economy, world's third largest economy. Uh, and its technological superiority and it's uh, still, I mean, we heard that Japan is not innovating, but there is a lot of innovation happening in Japan. And countries around the region, uh, they are very much after uh, Japan's uh, uh, not just capital, uh, but technology transfer, for example. And they see Japan as a source of, of that. Uh, so I do not see uh, Japan like declining in a way that its cloud will decline to the extent uh, that regional players uh, will 
uh, look away from, from Japan. So it's still they will remain engaged with Japan for obvious reasons that Japan has got the strengths. And, and those strengths are economic, technological, <laughs> as well as, in a sense, kind of uh, sort power of strength uh, as well, because the region really want to engage with uh, Japan, partly because of China's role in the region. Uh, so for those reasons, I think, um, you know, I, I do not see how Japan is going to uh, deteriorate to, a, to an extent uh, that it will have, it will lose its cloud. I think its cloud will, if at all, it might grow a little bit more as China tries to assert uh, more and more rather than Japan's uh, cloud declining in the region. That's my take on that issue. About post Abe, um, as uh, Jerry said, you know, when uh, Abe resigned in 2007, uh, no one thought, everyone kind of went off Abe, thought that he has gone from the political scene. And he came back, as he said in one of his uh, speeches in the US, that Japan is back and I'm back, so he's back. And uh, so for the last three, three and a half years, he has made an impact. And, uh, you know, certainly if, if for some reason, you know, Abe uh, is out of, uh, he, he goes, then I think there are options within the party itself. Uh, we know, I mean, I don't want to talk too much about individuals, but, uh, you know, recently Mr. Ishiba, uh, he resigned from his ministry, or he didn't accept any uh, official or, or any party or any ministerial position simply because he wants to prepare himself as a course of a possible uh, prime minister. And there are many others. We hear about Inada now as young, uh, upcoming uh, woman, female uh, politician. Then, of course, Kishida is a possibility again. So I, I don't think there's going to be a huge political turmoil in Japan if for some reason Abe goes all of a sudden not unexpected. Yes, um, from strictly Japanese security or defense policy point of view, I have two concerns. One is uh, China's rise, and second is U.S. commitment. China's rise is a fact, and we have to admit. And China's rise, how nice or how aggressive China would become in the future is a concern. And how strong the U.S. commitment to the Asia Pacific, maybe Australian friends agree with me, um, this stronger commitment is better for uh, for Japan. So better, uh, stronger commitment of U.S. and nicer uh, rise of China. That those uh, combination, that com combination is uh, is an you know, ultimate goal. Uh, if it takes 100 years, it, it, we need to start today. And uh, for, for doing so, I have uh, you know, at least uh, I, I want to point out three uh, three uh, um, considerations. One, China is not uh, China is not Soviet Union at all. Uh, during the Cold War, one day Soviet is gone. Nobody was so much worried. No, nobody uh, could have had any problem at all. But now. If uh, when China sneezes, some some countries get cold. So um, we are not living in in, the, in in such simple world. And secondly, this is the first time for the Chinese to face real international relations with uh, similar heights of uh, major powers. China used to be central center of the empire for, for thousands of years. And after that, um, what, uh, what they call 100 years of humiliation. Now it is the first time for the Chinese to face the similar height uh, major powers in the world. Uh, or, uh, in other words, this is the first time to have for, for them ever to, to face other countries with borders. So that is second thing. Third thing, U.S.-Japan alliance. I'm I'm a religious believer of U.S.-Japan alliance, but in the future, you know, um, the stronger alliance, stronger alliance does not uh, mean every, everything we agree. We may have uh, differences in opinion or in policies, um, international uh, international security, or international politics. Um, that is not necessarily bad. 
Uh, there may be things Japan w a n t to do, but、uh, politically cannot do,、uh, what, um, which can be done by the US, politically can, can be done by the United States. The, the, there may be things、uh, the US、uh, may, may not be able to do politically, perhaps a Congress, congressional resistance or sort of thing, and Japan can do. In, in,、uh, in, in such a case, Japan、uh, can do. It's a sort of complemental、uh, relations. The Russian policy,、uh, our policies vis a vis Russia、um, are different, but differences are, are not necessarily about、uh, always. So,、um, uh, just one thing you know, if, uh, uh, if, if we can make, make the difference、uh, to,、uh, to let the things、uh, go better. Japan's better relationship、uh, with Russia、uh, in, in comparison with the US,、uh, US Russian relationship may help Russians to look at、uh, Asia Pacific region through Japanese lens, not only the Chinese lens. As such, you know, we, we, can, we, can,、uh, we can help each other、uh, from a different point of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, there is obviously one, one immediate response to your sort of the two dilemmas question for Japan is.、Uh, Are they mutually incompatible? Can China's rise be nicer at the same time as the US commitment to Japan be absolutely guaranteed? Or will it, would the Chinese always see that US commitment to Japan as, as fundamentally a, a, a problem?、Uh, before you, I ask you to respond to that question,、um, let me see if there are more questions from the floor. Kerry? <coughs> Hi,、um, I'm k e r r y Young. I'm a PhD student in the Department of International Relations here at ANU.、Um, first of all, just want to thank all three of you for your wonderful, thought provoking comments. I found them really useful today.、Um, I, my question is for Professor Curtis,、um, following on from something you mentioned in this morning's session,、um, when you were talking again about Okinawa and how you suggest that the US and Japan should take a new approach to what's happening there. Um, I studied in Okinawa and like, US basing relations there. And I, I mean, the, the way the media presents it is probably a bit less, it's, not, it's a bit more complex than how the media presents it there.、Um, for example,、um, even though they cover the protests most often, like even with Okinawa, there are lots of elements that don't want, for example, a large reduction in the US military presence in Okinawa immediately. Um, or perhaps even in the long run for economic reasons. But on the flip side, then you have the strategic concerns, such as if you do greatly reduce the number of Marines or reduce the US presence in Okinawa, is, might that be seen as an invitation to China, for example, to become more aggressive in,、um, around the central islands or the South China Sea? So I was just wondering if you could comment a bit further on that and what your suggestion for a new approach might be considering all of these constraints, all of these concerns. I'd like to see if there's any other final questions that we want to take at this stage.、Uh, yeah, Ben?、Uh, ben Ashiano, also a PhD student here at the ANU. And we've been talking a lot about, like in the session just now, about domestic constraints on, on foreign policy making. And so, in that regard, I would like to ask if anyone could elaborate more on how they see the role of the LDP's junior coalition parliament, the core mate, or as how critical a factor was that in, in shaping the final outcome of, of the new security laws? Thank you. And, Ben, if I could ask you to pass the、uh, microphone to, to your right, thanks. Um, I had a question.、Uh, sorry, I'm Nick Printable. I'm from Defence.、Um, I had a question, particularly for Professor Curtis,、um, following on from what you were saying about the,、uh, the, the potential for Japanese engagement with、um, Southeast Asian nations. What do you think is the potential for Japan to engage with Taiwan,、um, particularly given that、um, Taiwan is also a claimant to the Senkaku Islands, but they have a new president who is potentially more sympathetic to them? Thank you. Well, great. Those are those are those are particularly the last question I'm particularly interested in. So, I'll talk. But first, so let me be brief. <laughs> so on Okinawa, no, I don't think anybody. I don't think the the. I wasn't advocating that we withdraw from from Okinawa, but we have too much. We we occupy too much land. We have too many troops, and the Marines that are at the air base at Futema should be re re relocated to Guam. Come to Darwin. There's lots of get beyond boats. There's lots of ways to get them out of Okinawa without building a new base in Hanuko, in my in my view. But but also, 
you know, when, when oh, in the years immediately following the reversion of Okinawa to, to Japanese sovereignty, American, uh, the contribution of, Ameri of American military personnel in Okinawa to the Okinawan economy was roughly around 15, 16% of Okinawan uh, uh, prefectural uh, income. Now it's down to about 6%. Tourism is way up, and tourism would be up much further if there was um, if there were less less troops there. And as I said this morning, I think the strategic the 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 the, the changing technology of warfare, the fact that Miss Ballistic that in a sense Kadena is a sitting duck for Chinese ballistic missiles, um, hardening these bases and having so much. Uh, 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 firepower concentrated in this land area seems to me to be very problematic. So I think we can have a rational uh, policy of reducing the American presence in Okinawa that would not stimulate the idea, that would not think, make the Chinese think that it's less of a commitment to the region. It actually strengthens our, our, it can strengthen our, our commitment to the region, or so it seems to me. But I'm particularly concerned about the political fallout from all the incidents that happened in Okinawa and the sense in you know this is this is a domestic Japanese problem in some ways more than it is a US Japan issue because the real concern about Okinawa is that they're so discriminated against by the rest of the country Japanese want American bases in Japan, but nowhere, but they don't want them in their own prefecture. You know, it's not in my backyard kind of, uh, of thinking. So Okinawa then ends up being the place where, they, where it, all, it all happens. Um, about the Komato, I think its role was very important uh, in defining what the reinterpretation of collective uh, defense uh, was was to be, and they it was much less it was much more constraining than what Prime Minister Abe had set out uh, to get. <clears throat> and the chairman of the Komito said just the other day, there will not be revision of Article Nine as long as the Komito is in the ruling coalition, and he means it, and it won't happen. So. Unless Abe replaces the Komeito with some other party that's more amenable to constitutional revision, its role is very big. Now, on Taiwan, <clears throat> I think the um, uh, you know Taiwan wants, is trying to diversify its its trade relations, so it's not so dependent on China as it is now. And you know Japan is a very important. Uh, uh, um, uh, Country for, for as far as the Taiwanese economy is concerned, uh, both in terms of trade and investment, we've seen um, uh, we're seeing you know Taiwan um, uh, investment uh, increasing uh, in in Japan, buying sharp the Chinese uh, the Taiwan company buying sharp and so on. But there's a real danger in in the in the Japan Taiwan relationship, which is that even though the the DPP is sort of to the left in Taiwan politics. Its best friends in Japan are on the right. And when uh, Tsai Ing-wen came to, uh, to Japan, just before she became uh, 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 elected as president, <coughs> and met with Japanese here, it was the LDP right that fettered her and that want to see Japan develop some kind of security relationship with Taiwan. This would be very dangerous in my view. You do not want to provoke the Chinese by making it look as though Japan is trying to develop a security relationship with Taiwan. So I think um, this is an issue that the Japanese need to be extremely cautious about and that the Taiwanese need to understand does not serve their interests. It does not serve their interests to have relations between China and Japan become more tense because of Taiwan. That would be disastrous. So I'm concerned about the Taiwan relationship. Uh, just on one point about Komeito. Um, I especially wanted to comment on that because I had about an hour one-on-one -on -one conversation with Mr. Yamaguchi recently. Uh, I initially, he, his secretary said 10 minutes, but uh, the conversation went for more than an hour. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. the fact, his secretary was uh, uh, knocking on the door that there's another fighter. <laughs> uh, but the point I want to make here is this. 
I agree what uh, Professor Curtis has said about uh, Cometo's uh, take on the amendment of the Constitution. Uh, but they have been a partner in incremental changes in what Japan's SDF and Japan's kind of SDF law. And they are happy to do that, but they are not willing at this stage to change the constitution to the, uh, to the uh, point what the LDP committee has recommended, 2013 LDP Committee on Constitutional Change. Uh, but the point I want to say, which you said that perhaps if Abe finds another partner, it is very difficult for the LDP to find another partner and be a winning party uh, because, uh, you know, uh, still uh, Sokagakai has got, uh, it mobilizes its uh, members to deliver force. And uh, the LDP is very, very aware of this fact under the revised electoral system, which is uh, first past the post system, uh, where the role of Kometo becomes very, very important in delivering votes uh, to the LDP. So my take is that the LDP is not going to commit suicide, political suicide, by severing its relationship with Cometo, and that's going to continue, and that puts a constraint on the LDP, whether Mr. Abe or anyone else, to change the constitution, despite the fact that Japan has got a two-thirds majority mm -hmm. in both houses. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes. I, I, I'd like to just uh, touch upon two points. Uh, one is uh, uh, Japan's dilemma between China and the US. Mm -hmm. Another is another one is Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And as to the dilemma between China and uh, China and the US uh, for Japanese, mm -hmm. um, uh, my position has been the same. Um, the, in late 1990s, uh, there used to be an argument between uh, dragon slayers and panda huggers. And, and at that time, I used to say, I want to clinch the dragon. Uh, in order to clinch the dra dragon, I need to have, have strong arms. And if the big guy uh, push my back to, towards, uh, towards the dragon, it is easier to clinch or hug uh, the dragon. That is the only, um, only solution uh, for, for the better for all. And in this sense, uh, I, I'd like to, to agree with uh, uh, Professor Curtis on Taiwan issue. We never want insecurity of China. So in that sense, uh, the, the Japanese policy vis-a-vis -vis China, or Taiwanese policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Taiwanese-Japanese uh, security cooperation should be very, very careful. And um, we, don't, we don't like an insecure China at all. And secondly, Okinawa, that two point. One, Okinawa is located very strategically important point. Um, many of you may have uh, heard about the uh, anti-access area denial uh, capability of China, um, in which uh, China may defuse uh, US uh, uh, mainly naval access uh, towards the Asian, Asian, Asian continent uh, by using, using mainly strategically defensive weapons. Uh, China may have that uh, capability, the denial capability, but you know, even Japan has denial capability too. And if uh, we have uh, denial capability on Okinawa, um, it may help U.S. forces reinforce us. Um, easier for the U.S. forces to come to the uh, Okinawa and other places um, uh, across Okinawa. And if uh, U.S. forces come to, to those places, um, our deny, area denial capability will be, become much stronger. So Okinawa is very uh, located in a very uh, important point. And secondly, uh, Okinawa has 1.4 million population, uh, among uh, within which uh, in comparison with only 20,000 um, U.S. military personnel in Okinawa, the visibility is too far high, high uh, than the reality. And this is simply because you know, Okinawa, on Okinawa, there was a land, land combat ground battle, so everything was flat. And after Okinawa, battle of uh, Okinawa, U.S. was um, preparing for the landing invasion of main islands of Japan. So U.S. Air Force, uh, Army Air Force, Navy, and Army uh, occupied the flat and 
and easy access to road and ports. That means easy for the population to gather. The Aftema, uh, for instance, uh, is located in a sort of uh, choke point, choke, north of choke point of the populated areas. So it is far more visible than necessary. If you go to Okinawa, you land on uh, Naha Airport, and right to Naha, Naha Airport, there is a port facility, US port facility. You, uh, right next to the very, very busy road, and green, and very beautiful uh, facility, and after going through the traffic jam in Naha City, you, you will see either right or left side the fence of US, uh, US, US bases. It's not necessary. So if we put uh, Aftema to other places than the, 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 the existing place, and um, visibility will be, become much, much lower, uh, close to the reality of uh, 20,000 uh, uh, military personnel, as opposed to 1.4 million Okinawans. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we are now out of time. Um, we've had an extremely rich final panel that I think has touched on some important domestic issues, uh, the wider regional context, and then some of these sort of continually thorny issues in the US-Japan relationship, such as Okinawa. Uh, would you please join me in thanking our panel, Jerry Curtis, and